read through uh, Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. This is the 10th sermon from this short letter. The choice is yours. One day, a long time ago now, my freshman year in high school, so what, maybe 1982, something like that, 81, 82. Man, live, I'm getting old. Uh, but my freshman year in high school, I remember one day during gym, the track coach came in and asked us uh, if anybody wanted to try pole vaulting. So always up for a new challenge, I raised my hand and said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try pole vaulting, that looks like fun. I, can see Tarzan, you know, through the jungle doing all that. And that's my hero, so I can do that. And so at first, when we started this um, pole vaulting experiment, at first it was easy. We, if you can picture in your mind, we, we started using a pole. And the pole was cemented into a tire, um, that, you know, if you can imagine that. And we were inside the gym, and he would set the bar at six or seven feet, somewhere around there, and we would lean that pole back and just kind of get our momentum going. You can't run, just momentum going and then jump. And the weight of the pole with that cement would go forward and then you would try to get over the bar and it would just propel you up uh, and throw your body over that high bar uh, from that. And, and um, I think maybe, you know, seven, seven and a half feet is what we could clear just using that, that system. After a couple days of practice, we went outside to the pole vault um, area, to the pit. And I was full of confidence, maybe a little cocky. You know, I was a decent athlete thinking I could do anything. And so I grabbed the pole. I took off running, stuck the pole in the ground, and launched myself up into the air. Uh, but um, uh, the momentum wasn't quite the same as with that tire. And so I don't know uh, how high I went. It was probably 100 or 2 feet up in the air. <laughs> I don't know how high it was, but I went straight up, straight down. It didn't throw me over. And there was no pole to go over. There was no bar. It was just to try to carry yourself, you know, to kind of get the hang of it. And I just went up and then came back down. And so my pole vaulting career was short-lived. I didn't... Uh, I didn't try it anymore. Now, obviously, the goal of pole vaulting is to vault yourself as high as you can, right? You know. Uh, I looked it up this week, and the world record for pole vaulting is 20.2 feet. Now, that's pretty high. I don't know. And here, this is maybe 50 feet, maybe. I don't know. That's just a guess uh, from that. But two basketball goals, high. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, <laughs> that's really a long, a long way up there. And, but one day, that's the world record right now, and one day that record will be broken, and then whatever the new record is, eventually somebody else will break that record, and then somebody else will break that record, and on and on it goes. And so if you think about it, a pole vaulter never reaches perfection. As soon as, the, as one bar is cleared, what do they do, right? They raise it up. Uh, another notch. And so you never quite succeed, basically, uh, at pole vaulting. The, and it's a never-ending cycle. And I use that as an analogy to talk about trying to live the perfect life or to be perfect. Uh, trying to live a perfect life or trying to please God on your own is similar uh, to pole vaulting. About the time you think you got it all together, and about the time you think that you're, quote, good enough, about the time that you think you've reached the height of perfection and, and all of that, you realize there's much more work that needs to be done. Um, Friday, I had the privilege of um, going to David Liskin University, and I was on a panel with some Master Divinity students talking about uh, mass incarceration. And uh, then we had lunch with the students, and we were, as I was talking to one of the students, you know, he's working on his master's, um, he, he told me, he said, you know, <clears throat> the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And I was like, yeah, I know that feeling a whole lot, you know. And so if it's pole vaulting or if it's education, it seems like the higher you go, the more you learn, the more you realize you got to learn still. And so how, how, how high do you got to jump to please God? That's kind of back to the pole vaulting illustration. How high do you got to jump to please God? 
If you think about it, that's, a, that's an impossible question to even answer, and it's even more impossible to try to achieve. Because the Bible tells us that God is holy, and He requires us to be holy as well. That means perfect, basically. And so God's require, God says, look, my requirement, because I'm a holy God and, and, and I, I can't uh, be around sin, if you want to please me and if you want to live with me forever, then you have to be holy as well. That's the standard. And so God's holiness requires complete perfection on our part. The problem is none of us are perfect. And the harder you try to be perfect, the more you realize that you're nowhere near perfect. And so God has this expectation or he has set this bar because of his holiness that none of us can achieve on our own. None of us then can please God on our own. Paul says this in Romans chapter 10. He says there is no one righteous, not even one. Think about it. I mean, there's been a lot of good people uh, who have walked and lived uh, in, on earth. And uh, there's a lot of good people now. But he says no one is righteous. Not even one. And so the purpose of the Old Testament law, and this is what Paul has been talking about in Galatians, the purpose of the Old Testament laws were to show us our sinfulness and our inability to live a life pleasing to God. I mean, how in the world can we be expected to keep all of those laws in the Old Testament? The law was designed, if you think about it, the law was designed to frustrate us and to show us how sinful we really are. The end result of the law was for all of us to get to the place where we just throw our hands up and we scream at God, God, I cannot do this. I need help. In reality, however, we don't need help. We need a savior. And so the purpose of the law, Paul says, was to lead us to Christ. By way of review, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, Paul says, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, which is Paul's entire point. Now faith has come. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. And then in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, he says, he says, But when the time had fully come, after the law had done its work, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights as sons. And so the law was, the purpose of the law was to lead us to Christ, to show us that on our own we can never live a life that is completely pleasing to God. And so we throw up our hands and we say, we can't do this. And at that time, God sent Jesus and said, I know you can't do it, but because I love you so much and I want a relationship with you, I am going to do what you could not do. And now that we are saved by faith, then we're no longer under the supervision of the law. And so Paul wrote this letter to the believers in Galatians to, to remind them um, that their relationship with God was based on faith and is based on faith in Jesus Christ. It's not based on keeping the law. It's not based on keeping a list of do's and don'ts, in other words. And so again, by way of review, Paul has used the following arguments to try to make his point that we are saved by faith. He talks about his own personal experience in Galatians chapter 3 and talks about how he was a Hebrew of all Hebrews. If anyone uh, could be saved or be right with God because of their righteous works, it was Paul. That's what he was saying from his personal experience. And then scriptural evidence. This is what the Bible says. Abraham uh, received the promise of God based on faith. And so you and I are the same way. And so he uses the scriptural evidence. Then logical conclusions. If anybody could be saved from the law, then there would be no purpose of grace is what he was saying. And so logically, it makes sense that, that the only way uh, to please God is through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the historical realities of Abraham and what he went through. And then sentimental reasons. And now he concludes his argument here by using an allegorical argument. You see this in verse 24, Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. Where Paul says, these things may be taken figuratively. And the Greek word that is translated figuratively is allegory. That's what the word is, is a transliteration. It's allegory. And so Paul says, I want to tell you a story, but, but it's going to be an allegory. 
Now, what is an allegory? Well, an allegory is a story in which, in which persons and actions represent hidden meanings so that the narrative can be read on two levels. There's a historical, literal interpretation, and then there's a symbolic interpretation. And so literally, the story that, that Paul's going to tell us is about two sons. It's a historical fact. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. That, that's the fact. That's what happened. But then symbolically, what he is going to say is that those two sons represent two covenants, two ways of approaching God. And you could say that an allegory is a parable that's based on facts. And so Paul's purpose, remember, is to remind the believers in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And so let's look at this allegory a little closer. There are two sons. That's the literal interpretation. These two sons represent two covenants. That's the symbolic interpretation. And so Paul refers to the birth of Abraham's two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And these two births represents two approaches to God. One is futile, is Paul's summary. The other equals freedom. And then he's going to say the choice is yours to decide which one of these two approaches you want to follow and you want to believe. So Paul begins this section by asking a question in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. He says, tell me, you who want to be under a law, under the law, are you not aware what the law says? Now, the law, of course, is referring to the books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Levit Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the law. And he's saying, well, surely you know what the law says. In reality, they probably had a good idea, but they wouldn't know everything because ultimately what the law says is if you violate one law, you violated all of them. And so it says, thou shalt not murder. But it also says that you shouldn't eat um, uncooked food. And so if you eat sushi, according to the law, then you're as guilty as a murderer. You know, so he's saying, don't you know that? Don't you know what the law says? And so he asked that, that very simple question. And so what does the law say? Well, look at verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. So here's very quickly an overview of Abraham's life. At the age of 75, Abraham was called by God to leave his homeland and go to a place that God said, I'll show you when you get there. And God promised that Abraham would have many descendants, and this is in Genesis chapter 12. But the problem was he and his wife Sarah had no children. It's hard to have descendants if you don't have children. If your mom and dad don't have children, there's a good chance you won't have children either. <laughs> you see. And so God promises them many descendants, but there's a problem. They don't have any kids. And so at the age of 85, Abraham and Sarah are still childless. And again, it's difficult to have descendants without a son, without any children. And so they become impatient with God, and, and they have a son through their slave, Hagar. Now, in that culture, that was seen as something quite natural. Was it seen as immorality like we may look at it? It was just seen as if, if you and your wife were having problems having children and you had a slave, well, the slave was your property. Slavery is a whole other issue, but the, the slave was your property, and so you could have a child through your slave, and that was okay. In fact, maybe one day we'll talk about this. The Bible actually talks about seven different forms of marriages or seven different kinds of marriage that you see in the Old Testament. And one is this relationship between a slave owner and a slave. And so Abraham and Sarah, they were trying to please God. I think this is why they did that. They were trying to please God. God said, you're going to have many children. They didn't have any children. And so the, the, the thing was, well, then how can we help God out? You ever felt like that? How can I help God out a little bit? And so they have a child through their slave, Hagar, at the age of 85. At the age of 99, God once again promises Abraham a son through Sarah and says that his name will be Isaac. That's in Genesis 17. And then at the age of 100, Isaac was born. Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. Then in Genesis chapter 21, at Isaac's third birthday party, 
Ishmael would have been about 16 years old at the time. And I would think culturally the third birthday party, in some cultures the first birthday party is a big deal. In some cultures you do not name your child until the first birthday because there's a good chance that child's going to die before it reaches one. And so you don't really name the child until they reach one. It could have had something to do like that. When the child was three, Hagar felt confident that nothing was going to happen to Isaac. And so Ishmael causes a scene at the birthday party. And so uh, Sarah goes to Abraham and basically tells Abraham to get rid of Ishmael and Hagar. And so off they go. They're banned. They're forced to leave. And then over time, Isaac's descendants become the Israelites and Ishmael's descendants become the Arabs. And to this day, there's still conflict between the Israelis and the Arabs. And it's all a sibling rivalry. So the story of Hagar and Sarah, Ishmael and Isaac are true stories. That's what happened. But the lessons that Paul draws from their story are spiritual. And so uh, the point of today's sermon is what are those lessons? Well, again, what Paul says is that both sons represent a covenant between God and man. Both sons symbolize ways to become right with God. And so he says in verse 23, his son by the slave woman, Ishmael, was born in the ordinary way. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. Now that phrase, ordinary way, is interesting. Because literally it means according to the flesh. So in reality, both Isaac and Ishmael were born in the ordinary way. I don't have to go into detail, right? We all know what that is. You know, but now he, sh he shifts to allegory and said this one son was the ordinary way, but Isaac was born because God had promised that Isaac would be born. Ishmael, symbolically speaking, was the result of Abraham and Sarah trying to please God on their own. And folks, there, there's probably not too many days or weeks that goes by where we don't try that same thing. We're going to please God on our own. And it doesn't work out. Ishmael was the result of doing the right thing the wrong way, in other words. And again, how many of us are guilty of that? Ishmael was the result of trying to help God out, of trying to do God's will your own way. Isaac, on the other hand, symbolically speaking, was the fulfillment of the promise that Abraham believed in and God counted that as righteousness. And so then what is the meaning of the two births? Well, first, in the allegory, Ishmael represents the old covenant, Isaac represents the new covenant of grace. Furthermore, the old covenant resulted in bondage. You are now slaves to the law. The new covenant results in freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The old covenant, Paul says, is dead, but the new covenant gives life. So look at verse 24. These things may be taken figuratively. For the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai where the law was given in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because, because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is your mother. And he's talking about Sarah again, symbolically. For it is written, be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. That's each of us. We are Abraham's seed, not physically, but spiritually. We're children of promise. So now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? 
Get rid of the slave woman. This is from Genesis after Ishmael caused the scene. Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with with the free woman's son. And then here's his conclusion, verse 31. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman. If you're trying to please God on your own by keeping the law, by being legalistic, then then you're, you're, you're acting like you're a child of a slave. And Paul says, you're not the child of a slave woman, but of the free woman. You have been saved by grace. You see. And so you have the old and the new covenant. You know, people like to market themselves. There might be a product that comes out and then after it gets a little old and stale, the company will repackage it and say it's the new and improved, right? It's the new and improved. And so you get new Coke, which is not better than the old Coke, but it's the new and approved. And now they're trying again. New Coke is out there again. But you have this one product and then you think, you know, <laughs> um, I had to update my modem from a, a Comcast uh, the, uh, and they promised it was new and improved. And I've had nothing but problems since I updated. You know, it's not the new and improved like they promised. But when God promises us a new covenant, it is incredibly better than the old because it's based on grace. And so how do these two compare, the old and the new? Well, again... What Paul has been saying in Galatians is the old covenant depended on self-effort. You got to keep the law and you got to keep all those laws. And if you violate one law, you violated all of them. The new covenant depends on God's grace. Now I'm thankful for that. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. That is grace. That doesn't give me a license just to do whatever I want to do. You don't understand grace if that's your mentality. But I am thankful that, that, it's not, that, that God is not a meritocracy. He, he doesn't look at salvation based on how good we are. But rather he says, you know what? We're all equal and so it's grace. And all of us need that. That's better. The old covenant depends on self-effort. The new covenant depends on grace. The old covenant then has to be earned. The new covenant is given freely to all who believe. Man, that's good news. That's good news. It's a better way. If you think about it, the old covenant has no security. The new covenant, however, offers security for all eternity. We believe. Years ago when I was teaching uh, sociology, one day after class, uh, a young lady, I can't remember her name, but she was of the Muslim faith. Uh, She came up to me and was talking to me and was telling me that there was going to be a week uh, when she was out of school um, and I asked she was she was going to I don't remember the country now but um, uh, but she was going on her her pilgrimage that is required of, of Muslims to go and march around the uh, I mean, my mind has gone blank today. I'm on, I'm on vacation. Right? But it's marching around this, uh, the thing that basically the bones of Adam are supposed to be in it. So that's where creation started. That's where everything is. And a good Muslim, before they die, will go there and they'll ha- take this pilgrimage and they'll march around this thing uh, so many times. And I said, man, that's exciting. And then she said, yeah. She said, I'm so glad. And, and, she, and, I, and then she made a comment that's basically because now if I do that, then I might get into heaven when I die. Wow. Going to all that work and still no security. No security. And we talked a little bit and I told her, well, you know, from the Christian perspective, we believe in Jesus and we know. We don't have to doubt. She said, yeah, I know that, but this is what I believe. And so the old covenant has this you got to earn it. You, and if you got to earn something, then there's really no security because you never know if you've done enough. But the new covenant, based on grace, you believe you're saved by faith, you're kept by faith, and as long as your faith is in Jesus Christ, you can know that you have security. So the new covenant is better. And then the old covenant, Paul says, leads to condemnation ultimately because you can never do enough. The new covenant, he says, leads to salvation. We are 
saved by faith. So after telling this story, Paul ends this section and then he transitions into the next section by writing Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, which is the theme verse of the entire letter. And so it kind of pivots from you know, his arguments and now he's going to make some application. And this is the pivotal verse in all of Galatians. He's, he writes again, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And so there are two important applications from that verse, that transitional verse. The first application is implied. The second one is stated quite clearly. So here's the implied application. What Paul is telling us is, look, place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Not in works, not in what you do or don't do. You place your faith in Jesus. Paul has stated that very clearly throughout the letter. But once again, he wants to remind his readers that we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And so here's the point. Are you trying to please God on your own? Are you trying to do God's will your way? You know, and usually when we do that, that means we get in a hurry. We act too soon. Do you think you need to get your life together before you turn to Christ? I mean, I've taught people like that. Especially if it comes time for baptism. It's like, well, you know, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. What they're saying is I still got work to do before that. But no, no, no. You, you got it all backwards. You don't, get your, you don't get your life right and then come to Christ. You come to Christ and then the power of the Holy Spirit starts to clean you up. The only way to receive forgiveness and experience true freedom is to turn to Christ and to place your faith in him. There really is no other way. And so right now, what, what Paul is saying is, look, put your faith in Christ. Now, what's interesting is he's talking to a church where most of the people have already done that. So he's reminding them that you've got to return back to that. You've gotten off track. You've started trusting other things. You can trust nothing but Christ. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to come into your life. And then the application that's pretty clear in chapter 5, verse 1, is he tells us then to stand firm in your faith. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So Paul's saying, don't stop believing. We are saved by faith, and we continue in faith. Christ has set you free. Don't go back into slavery. You know, I used to have a hard time, and this is my own fault, and this is a confession. I used to have a hard time understanding that. How in the world could anybody, once they receive freedom in Christ, want to go back to that? But yet, the ministry now, working with people, and my own self included, who have problems, we see that over and over again. Christ has set you free, but then you go back to that former way of life. You go back into slavery. And then if you study history, you see the same thing. Even after the Civil War was over and slaves were free, slaves, some of the freed slaves would voluntarily go back into submission to their slave owners instead of walking in freedom. Paul says, don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. Stand firm. Don't allow yourself to become a prisoner to legalism. Don't allow yourself to become a prisoner to your own flesh. Don't allow yourself to become a prisoner to religion. God has freed you in Christ. Walk in that freedom. Trust Christ and stand firm in your faith. That's really Paul's whole letter. Now, that took two sentences instead of ten sermons. <laughs> Trust Christ. Stand firm in your faith. That's what the whole letter's about. And if you think about it, what other encouragement, what other, what other thing do we need to hear every day of our lives when you get up? Oh, I got to trust Christ. I got to stand firm in my faith. I got to trust Christ. I got to stand firm in my faith. And if we would do that, trust Christ, stand firm in your faith, then whatever happens throughout our day, we would be able to handle with God's grace and the Holy Spirit empowering us. So the cho choice is yours. Do you want to go back into that old way of life or into that legalism and be in bondage? Or do you want to walk further into the freedom that Christ already has for you? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves 
be burdened again by that yoke. God has saved you by his grace. You are free. Stand firm in that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word and even how I need to be reminded that salvation, um, sanctification, glorification, whatever big words you want to use, is all based on faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And so, Lord, forgive us where we fall short of that. Help us to stand firm in our faith and not get bogged down by the things of this world that can enslave us and, and cause us to lose sight of what's really important. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the freedom that we have in you. And even uh, this week as we celebrate the freedom of our country, may we remember that ultimately the freedom that is important is the freedom we have in you. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name.